Okay, so today we're going to look at 2.4. Okay, 2.4 is on solving inequalities. Um, we'll do a little bit of by algebra, then we'll do also some um, graphing calculator work. Okay, so generally the four inequality symbols that we see are less than, less than or equal to, greater than, greater than or equal to. Um, there is one more symbol that's not equal to, okay, but we won't be using that um, today. But this is an inequality as well. It's not equality, that would be an equal sign. Okay, but we'll stick with the four on the left. There's some examples of an inequality. Okay, the one on the left is an inequality that is always true. And the one on the right, that's a conditional inequality. It's true for specific values of x. What's different about a conditional inequality versus a conditional equation? What's the big difference with the number of answers that you get? Okay. Yeah, you could get, there are an infinite number of answers that make this inequality true. Okay. Versus a conditional equation, there's only one. Okay, so we say that a number is a solution to an inequality. If you take it, you plug it in for the variable, and you end up with a true statement. So, if I wanted to check, let's say, 2. Is 2 a solution to this inequality? Well, I plug it in. I get 3 times 2 is 6. 6 is greater than 12. Okay. Did that end up with a true statement? Okay, Michael? No. No. So that means that 2 is not a solution to that inequality. Okay, let's check um, 7. If I plug in 7, 3 times 7 is 21. 21 is greater than 12. Okay, is that true? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is true. So that means 7 is one, at least one solution to that inequality. Any question on how you check to see if a number is a solution to an inequality? All right. So one type of inequality you can have is a conjunction. Okay. A conjunction when you have two inequalities, okay, and it's connected by the word and. Two inequalities connected by the word and. Okay. While we're talking about this type, does anybody know the other type? Or the word that's used to connect the other type? Yeah? Well, I know the word. So. Or, does anybody know what that's called? Not a conjunction, but a, yeah? No, not a condition. Yep. Go ahead, Nick. Oh, you're not sure? Disjunction. Okay, and or, when it's connected with or, that's a disjunction. Okay, so here's an example of a conjunction. X is greater than negative 1, and X is less than 3. A lot of times when we have a conjunction, it's, it's an interval. Okay, we can pick numbers between negative 1 and positive 3. We can also take a conjunction and we can combine that. Okay, how would you combine these two inequalities into one? Now how, how would you do that? Oh, well, Brian? Um, put them together like uh, x would be in the middle. Yep, x would be in the middle, exactly, that's the idea. And if you want to use less than symbols, you put the smaller number on the left, the bigger number on the right. So this says x is greater than negative 1, and x is less than 3. I generally use less than or less than or equal to's, and then the smaller number is always on the left, bigger number on the right. Okay, so the range of numbers that we're talking about here between negative 1 and 3, that's called an inter interval. Um, and strictly, we have to be between. We can't equal the endpoints of the interval in this case. That's why it's called an open interval. Okay, so we're going to talk about some different words today that describe intervals. We're going to use the words open, 
closed, bounded, and unbounded. Okay, let's start with um, what a bounded interval is. Okay, so basically, in a bounded interval, the endpoints are actually numbers, as opposed to being, say, infinity as one of your endpoints. Okay, so in a bounded interval, your endpoints are numbers. Okay, so A and B in this case are real numbers. This is what we call a closed interval. Okay, closed interval uses a bracket on each end. It's like the greater than or equal to, less than or equal to. If we were graphing it, sometimes you use a filled in circle, okay, if you're used to doing it that way. Okay, this is an open interval. Okay, open interval uses parentheses on each end. That would correspond to having less than and greater than signs. We could use an open interval to describe the inequality right there. That's an open interval. Okay, um, what other types do you think I could have? I said there's four. So there's closed, open, What else? And how you say this one depends on if you're pessimistic or optimistic. Yeah? Half open. Sure, half open. I like it that way. That's more optimistic. Or you could say half, half closed. Okay. But that's a half open interval. Specifically, we could say it's half open on the right. And here's another half open interval. This time it's half open on the left. If you were going to use the closed way to say it, you'd say the, the top one here is half closed on the left, the bottom one is half closed on the right. But I usually stick with open. Okay, so those are your four types of bounded intervals. Page, um, page 99 gives you some more examples and more explanation if you, if you need it. Okay, so if we have bounded intervals, we also have unbounded intervals. Okay, unbounded intervals is when one or both of the endpoints use infinity or negative infinity. So what that means is there is no bound, there is no upper limit or lower limit in your interval. Okay, now kind of we're going to combine the two ideas of open and closed with unbounded. Is there any kind of interval that wouldn't make sense using the ideas of open and closed together with unbounded? Certain combinations of open and closed do make sense. Some, some don't. Yeah? A closed interval wouldn't make sense? Right. A closed interval wouldn't make sense. Closed means it's something you can reach. Okay, you can actually equal that value. Um, when we have unbounded intervals, the part that the infinity is on will never be closed. You can't reach it. So anytime you have an unbounded interval, it always has to be at least half open, or it could be fully open on each end. Okay, part of it could be closed. Like if you go from negative infinity up to and including 3. Or if you go, say, from positive 5, up, including positive 5, up to infinity. Okay, it's half open, half closed. The bottom examples are fully open. Okay, so there's no such thing as a closed, unbounded interval. That, that doesn't make sense. And on page 100, they go over some more examples with that. Okay, so what I want to do is take something that's written as an interval and write it as an inequality. Okay, so the first one is the interval from negative 3 to 5. Open on negative 3, closed on 5.
Okay, how about uh, Justin? How do we write that as an inequality? Negative three is? Well, what does that symbol mean, the parenthesis? It's open. It's open. What kind of, does open mean you reach the number or you do not reach that number? You reach it. Nope, that's closed. So closed means you actually can reach it. So like on infinity, because we can't reach it, we use a parenthesis. So what kind of symbol would you use if you cannot reach three? Uh, just less than. Yeah, be strictly less than. X. Okay, and then what about the other half? Uh, less, than less than or equal to five. Okay, so there's our inequality. Any question on that? Right, let's try this one. Um, from negative four to infinity. How about uh, Josh? How would you write that as an inequality? Um, negative 4 is greater than or less than or equal to x. Negative 4 is less than or equal to x. Okay. And x is less than infinity. Okay. Do you have to say x is less than infinity? Mm -hmm. Or is it everything pretty much less than infinity? Yeah, everything's less than infinity. So you could just say it like that, or you could say it this way. Either way. Most people like to put the variable on the, on the left. So you just say x is greater than or equal to negative 4. No, no upper limit. Okay, and how about this one? x is the interval from negative 8 to negative 3, and it's a closed interval. Oh. Um, Carly, how do you think you'd do that one? Um, negative 8, less than or equal to x. Yep. Less than or equal to negative 3. Less than or equal to negative 3. Perfect. Okay, looking at example A, how would you classify that interval? What, what type of interval is it? And if you say like it's half something, try to be specific on which side you're the half is on. Yeah, go ahead. It's half closed? Yeah, it's half closed. On the right. OK, half closed on the right, sure. Okay. How about B? How do we describe that one? Silvio? Uh, half open on the right. That one's half open on the right. And how about C? Michael? Closed. Closed. That's a closed interval. No need to say closed on the left and the right. If you just say closed, it's closed on both ends. Let's take a look at graphing a couple. Um, generally, our book is going to use either a bracket or a parenthesis. They don't use the open circle, closed circle. Okay, so I'll stick, um, I'll stick with the way the book does it. And you can see that on page 100, how they do it. All right, so let's graph x is greater than or equal to 2. Okay, generally what I look for is you make... You make your number line, and all you have to do is number a couple, couple spots on it. That's good enough. All right, what kind of symbol do I need on two? If I'm going to stick with the bracket and parenthesis, how about um, Tahina? Uh, okay, and what is that? Is that the bracket or parenthesis? Yeah, bracket on two. And which way are we going to shade? To the right. To the right. Say, when you use the bracket in parentheses, you have to be a little bit intelligent about which way it faces. If you were doing a closed circle, you don't. Right? So the bracket has to face to the right. So that's x is greater than or equal to two. Let's try x is less than 5. Okay, so make your number line. And Lasan, 
what kind of symbol am I going to need and which way will I shade? Yep, parenthesis on five. And we're going to shade to the left. So parenthesis on five and shade left. Okay, any question on that one? Show one more. Okay, this time we have a conjunction. X is greater than or equal to negative 1, and X is less than 3. Negative 1, 0, 1, 2, 3. Okay, so Julia, um, what about on the negative 1? What kind of symbol do I need? Bracket, and which way will it face? To the right. Yep, it's going to face to the right. And Taylor, what kind of symbol will I need on three? Oh, parenthesis. Parenthesis, very good. And which way will it face? To the left. To the left. Okay, so I've got my symbols. And now, um, Brandon, where am I going to shade? Yep, I'm going to shade between. And that's our picture. If you were used to doing it from algebra 1, you probably did a closed circle on negative 1, open circle on 3. Same, same idea. Okay, when we solve an, uh, an, equation, an inequality algebraically, we use pretty much the same steps you'd use when you solve an equation. What's the only thing that can happen here, though, that's different than an equation? Something can happen, Josh? True, there is more than one answer, so you might end up with like x is greater than 4, which means it's any number greater than 4. Um, and there's one other thing as you're actually solving it that can happen. Carly? If you divide by a negative, it switches the sign. Okay, that's, that's half of it. If you divide by a negative, the sign would flip. Anything else, Michael? If you multiply by a negative, it flips. Right. If you multiply or divide by a negative on each side, you have to flip the direction of the inequality. Okay, that's all you have to know. If you multiply or divide each side by a negative, flip the inequality. Other than that, just use all your um, properties from Algebra 1. Okay, so Andrew, what would be my first step? Um, to solve that inequality. Uh, distribute the yep, distribute the three. Okay, my next step, um, Silvio. Yeah, what do we get when we combine our like terms? Um, negative one. Yep, three so x minus one. Less than or equal to 5x plus 6. Okay, Justin, my next step. Sure, add 1. So that gives me 3x is less than or equal to 5x plus 7. Okay, I'm going to bring the 5x to the other side. So 3x, I'm going to take away 5x. That gives me negative 2x. Okay, and Cassie, what's my last step? You're going to divide by negative 2 and flip the sign. Yep, divide by negative 2. That cancels and flip the sign. So it becomes x is greater than or equal to negative 7 halves. Okay, any question on solving that? Okay, just don't forget to flip the sign. That's usually the mistake people make. Let's take a look at how we do it on a graphing calculator. There's a couple different methods we can use to solve an inequality. The first method has to do with getting 0 on one side of the inequality, calculating a root, and then determining where the graph is either positive or negative. It depends on the problem. If it's a greater than 0, 
problem, you'd want to know where it's positive. If it's a less than zero problem, you'd want to know where it's negative. Let's try this one. 4x minus 1 is less than 2. Okay, Shannon, what would be the easiest way to get 0 on one side? Subtract 2. Yeah, just subtract 2 from both sides. Okay, so I'll subtract 2. Subtract 2. 2 minus 2, that gives me 0. Now, do I have to flip the sign because I just, I'm just subtracting? No, I don't flip when I'm subtracting. Right. So I'll subtract 2, 4x minus 3 is less than 0. Okay, any question on that? Right, so now we've got to graph it. Okay, in y1 just type 4x minus 3, and we're looking for where this graph is less than 0. So first we have to find where it crosses 0. Okay, how do I calculate the um, point where it crosses 0? What do I have to press on the calculator? Michael? Second calc. Second calc, yeah. And then 2. If you have a TI-82, it's going to say root. If you have something newer, it's going to say 0. Pick a point somewhere to the left. Pick a point somewhere to the right. And then do a guess. And it says uh, x is 0.75. OK, so when x is 0.75, that's the point at which this graph goes from being um, between negative and positive. That's when it equals 0. So how would I write my answer? I want to know where the graph is strictly less than 0. So what are the x values that cause that to happen when x is what? Yep. Less than 0.75. X has to be less than 0.75. How come you didn't say less than or equal? Because the 0.75 is exactly 0. Right. If this was a less than or equal problem, I would have used the less than or equal. But they want to know where it's strictly negative. Any question on that? That's it. Okay, if you had something more complicated, like you had a, um, let's say you had a parabola. And you wanted to know where is the parabola less than 0? Well, you'd have to calculate a couple roots, and it, the answer would be an interval. So you could calculate the root on the left, the root on the right, and I would say if it's strictly less than between those two roots, that's where it's less than 0. If I wanted to know where it's more than 0, well, I'd still have to calculate each root, but then it would be anything less than the root on the left and anything more than the root on the right. That wouldn't be a conjunction. That'd be a disjunction. That'd be an or. Right. Okay, and the other method for solving an inequality is just to graph it the way it is. So let's graph that. Put 4x minus 1 in y1 and put 2 in y2. Four x minus one. Put that in y one. Put two in y two. And now we're going to calculate an intersect. And then we have to determine from that intersect: Do we want the points basically above that or below that? Or you could think of it as left of it or to the right of it. So in this case, I want to know where y1 is less than y2. That's where is my line with a slope of 4 below the horizontal. Right. So we're doing the same problem we just did, except now we're doing it with a uh, method 2. So for, we're looking for where the line with the slope is below the horizontal. So I've got to calculate the intersect. What do you think the intersect is going to be? Should come out to what? Yeah. 0.75. It should come out to 0.75, because this is the same problem. 
Okay, so we get 0.75. And now we go back at our problem. We're looking for where the line on the diagonal is less than the horizontal line. Okay, that'll happen anywhere to the left of 0.75. It'll always stay below the horizontal. It's the same answer. Any question on how to calculate either a root or an intersect to solve an inequality? Okay, just make sure you have 4x minus 1 in y1 and 2 in y2. And that should fix it. Let's look at solving a double inequality, okay, or like a conjunction. Okay, the goal here is to isolate x in the middle. And the only thing that's different is you have three parts you have to do each operation to. So with an equation, you have a left and a right. Well, here you have a left, a right, and a middle. So whatever you do to the middle, you also have to do to the left and the right. Okay, so our first example says negative 3 is less than 2x plus 5 divided by 3, which is less than or equal to 5. Okay, Orlando, what would be my first step um, to solve that? Multiplying both sides by 3. Yep, multiplying both sides and where else? Oh, and the middle, yeah. So we'll multiply by 3 by 3, and by 3. So now in the middle we just have 2x plus 5. And on the left side we have 3 times negative 3 is negative 9. Okay, how about uh, Marina, my uh, next step? Negative 14, less than or equal to, what's in the middle? 2x. Yep, 2x, which is less than or equal to 10. And what's my last step? How about prime? Uh, divide both sides by 2. And where else? In the middle. In the middle, yep. So divide the middle, left, and the right. So 2's are going to cancel. Negative 14 divided by 2. We get negative 7 is less than x, which is less than or equal to 5. Okay, how would I write that as an interval? So that's as an inequality, but I might also write it as an interval. Yep? You have your open, so you have parentheses, negative 7, comma, then you have 5 and a bracket. Perfect. Okay, so you should be pretty comfortable with either way. You could use either, either method on a test. Hey, any question on solving that? I think we don't really need a calculator um, for, that, for that type of problem. We could, but in this case we're not. All right, so this one says, consider that all the rectangles where the length is one unit more than twice the width. So we did a problem kind of like this in a couple homework assignments. Uh, it says find an algebraic representation of the rectangles that have a perimeter less than 100. Okay, first thing we should do is sketch our rectangle. And it says consider the set of rectangles where the length is one unit more than twice the width. So which side here, the length or the width, is going to be represented as a single letter? Marina? The width. The width. The yep. And now the length is one unit more than twice the width. Okay, so Brandon, how would I represent that? Yep. If 
perfect. Okay, 2w plus 1. And we know the perimeter is 100. Well, actually, in this case, it says the perimeter is less than 100, sorry. Okay, anybody give me an inequality that would fit what we have here? So we know the perimeter is at 100. Put that on one side. Marina? So if you did all your distributing, I just did it in my head, it would be 6w, well, it's less than 6w plus 2. So less than here? Yeah. Or, I'm sorry, greater than. OK. Yeah, it depends on which side you put the, um, the 100 on. You want your perimeter. We're going to put the perimeter on the right. So we want that to be less than 100. So maybe to make it make sense, we could have put the 100 on the other side. But go ahead. What did you get for your distributive when you did all that out? 6W plus 2. So 6W plus 2. Yep. Okay, any question on that? So she doubled the length, doubled the width, and then added them up. <coughs> plus 2. Okay, now it says find the possible widths of these rectangles. So we'll take the problem we just had and solve it. So minus 2 from each side. And divide by 6. Okay, so we get about 16, if we just round it, um, 16 and a third, or 16.3. Just round that. So the width has to be less than 16.3 inches. to satisfy what they wanted. Okay. Is there any other restriction we should have on the width besides being less than 16.3? Yeah. Greater than zero. Yeah, we should mention that the width has to be greater than zero. So we could just write that separate. And it has to be greater than zero. If you wanted, you could combine that into a single inequality. Um, but that is an important restriction to mention. Okay. If you didn't, you'd You'd lose a point for that. Hey, any question on that one? Right. So let's take a look at some absolute value inequalities. Okay, to solve an absolute value inequality, it's very similar to what we did yesterday with an absolute value equation. We're going to have to isolate the absolute value expression, and then we're going to split the original problem into two. Okay, the first equation we split it into, it's exactly the same as the original, except you just take away the absolute value bars. Okay, so first, first inequality is the same as the original, except you take away the absolute value bars. Now yesterday when we solved equations, what's the one extra thing we had to do in the second, to get the second equation? Yeah, Josh? Right, we have to change the sign of the number on the other side. But what else happens when you do that with an inequality? Like if you were to divide each side by negative 1 to change the sign, you would also have to, yeah? Yeah, you'd have to flip the inequality. Okay, so if you, if you have to do three things to get the second one. One, take away the absolute value bars. Two, flip the sign. Three, Chain negate the number on the other side. Okay, so it's very, very similar to what we did yesterday, except now you've got to remember on the second inequality, flip the sign. Okay, and there's one other thing that happens here. Our final answer, we're going to have two parts to it. And it's either going to have an and, or it could have an or. Okay. So in the original problem you're solving, if you have less than, or less than or equal to, 
you're going to connect your two answers with an and. So the way I remember it, less than, use and, land. Right? If you have greater thans, or greater than or equal to, that's when we use an or. So you can kind of think of it as greater than, you use or, even though we're spelling it a little differently. Land and gore. All right, so that's the trick. Land is and, less than and. Okay, the symbol sometimes you see is the intersect or the union. Okay, we use the union quite a bit when we did um, an interval. Okay, when you write it as an inequality, though, you don't use these union and intersect symbols. You use and and or. Okay. If you're going to do intervals, then you can use the symbols on the right. Depends how you're doing it. Okay, so let's try this one. The absolute value of x minus 3 is less than 3. Okay, um, Tahina, can you give me my first inequality? Same as the original. Just take away the bars. x minus 3 is less than 3. Okay, somebody else? How about my second inequality? How about uh, Nick? x minus 3 is less than negative 3. x minus 3, one more time. Is less than negative 3. Um, close. The x minus 3 is good, the negative 3 is good. One thing I have to fix. Uh, greater than. Yeah. So you have to flip the sign. Okay, and what's going to be the word between these two? Is this an and or is this an or? Go back and look at the original. In the original problem, what was the symbol? And then decide from there. Yep. An and. This is an and. We had a less than, so that's an and. So generally, when you have an and, you're shading between two points. An or, you're usually shading in opposite directions. OK, solve each one. So x is less than 6. And add 3 on each side. x is greater than 0. Okay, closed or open or half interval? What kind of interval here, Marina? Yep, completely open. Right, so if you were going to write it, um, you could condense this all into 1 by doing this. 0 is less than x, less than 6. Okay, that's also fine. Or you could write it as an interval from 0 to 6. That's also fine. Any questions on that? Okay, so I want to look at this and see if we can translate this into a absolute value inequality. Okay, it says if x is less than a units from b. I want to know how I could write that as an absolute value inequality. Let's just look at the part that says we have x, we have b, and we want to know how far apart they are. How do you find the distance between two numbers? What do you do with them? Michael? Subtract them. Subtract them. And if you want distance, what do you have to do with that difference that you find to make sure it's a distance? Take, well, the absolute take the absolute value. So if you take the absolute value of x minus b, that tells you how far apart they are. And in this case, we want that distance to be less than a units. So we just take the absolute value of x minus b. That's the distance between x and b. And we want that to be less than a units. 
Okay, you might see this kind of equation if you were uh, manufacturing parts and you were doing something that had a certain tolerance. You might have a given value that the part is supposed to have, like say it's supposed to have a width of 0.342 inches. Okay? And you have a part that comes out 0.341. Okay? Well, if your tolerance is, say, five thousandths of an inch, that would be okay, because that was only one thousandth of an inch off. Right? So that's where you could see this kind of equation. And maybe there's a computer that has that programmed in as the parts go down the um, assembly line. If they don't, if a laser measures it and it doesn't fit that equation, then the part is discarded and, and not used. Okay? So that's an example where you could see something like that. Okay, so our first one here says x is within four units of the origin. How would I write that? x is within four units of the origin. So whatever you give me, if I were to solve it, I would get all the numbers that are within four units of the origin. Yep. Four colors here. So how would you write that as an absolute value in equality? Oh. All right, so we have to identify what x, b, and a are. So in this case, x, x is my variable. But what's b? No, a is 4 in this case. So the number of units that you want to be within from a certain number, that goes on the other side. So a is 4. But what's b? We're measuring the distance between x and what? Orlando? The origin. The origin, which is? So I can't write x minus origin in my absolute value. And b has a number associated with it. Zero? Zero, yep. That's the inequality that represents all values within four units of the origin. which would be all numbers between negative 4 and 4, if you solve it. Okay, how about this one? x is less than 3 units from 2. So x is less than, or x is within 3 units of the number 2. So see if you can identify what b is and then what A is. And then just plug them in. Yep, what's on? Um, is less than three, yes. If you solve that equation, that'll give you all, or that inequality, it'll give you all the numbers that are within three units of two. So we're talking about um, up to five and down to negative one. Those are all within three units of two. Okay, and how about this one? What's going to be a little different here? X is at least five units from negative three. It's going to change this time. This time we're going to use a greater than instead of less than. Yeah, we're going to use a greater than instead of a less than. So we're talking about all the numbers that are a minimum distance from a certain point. Specifically, five units away from the number negative three. Okay, so what's going to go inside my absolute value this time? Yeah, go ahead, Marina. So remember the oh, number of yeah the number of units were away, that goes on the right side. Would it because you have a negative would it be x plus three? Yes. And then on the right side that would be your five. Okay, so if you go ahead and solve that, you get all the numbers that satisfy that word problem. Any question on that? Okay, 
let's um, solve this one. It says to solve and graph. It doesn't specifically say how to solve it. So let's um, choose the graphing calculator. Okay, we just solved one by hand using algebra a minute ago, so let's try it this way. Okay, first thing you have to do is go to your abs get your absolute value in there. So that's math, number, absolute value. On a TI-82, I think you can just press second absolute value. It's a little different. Okay, so 3x minus 2. And I'm going to do this one as an intercept. If I wanted to do it as a root, I could have subtracted one from each side. Okay. So what I'm going to be looking for is where is my absolute value above the horizontal line. So there's my absolute value. And I want to know everywhere that it's above the horizontal line. Okay, let's zoom in just a little bit to that spot. Absolute value, horizontal line. So I need to calculate both intersects. Second, calc, intersect. Your guess is important because if you, depending on which one you're closer to, that's the intersect you're going to get. Okay, so one third. That's one answer. So if x is less than a third or greater than a third, which way do I want that here? Michael? Less than. Right. If x is less than a third, your absolute value is above, greater, than the horizontal line at 1. So x could be strictly less than a third. Or could be something else. I use an or because of the symbol I had up above. Calculate your other intersect. One. So if x is less than a third, or do I want greater than one or less than one? Bob Brian? Uh, greater than one. Yeah, greater than one. Yep. Any questions on that one? All right, this one would be very, very similar. Does anyone have a question on how you would how you do that one? You could do it as a root if you minus four from both sides. Okay, but in this time you're just looking for where it's less than or equal. So make sure your answer has the equals in it under your inequality. All right, I think let's, um, let's finish up with this one. This time they want us to solve that algebraically. OK, so it says x plus 3 divided by the absolute value of x minus 2. You want to know where that's greater than 0. And the best way to solve this is to try to use a little bit of common sense. Okay, any thoughts about that inequality? Yeah? Shouldn't you multiply both sides by x minus 2 to get rid of the fraction? Well, if we multiply both sides by what's in the denominator here, then it's going to disappear because we're going to multiply it by 0, which in this case it wouldn't affect the problem. But sometimes we have to be careful if things disappear because that could affect our answer. But they want to know where that fraction is going to be greater than 0. So what's important that you focus on in that fraction? There's something that's very important to focus on, and there's something that doesn't really matter. Yeah? The denominator. Does the denominator matter, or it doesn't matter? It does. It does? Why? Well, if it equals 0, then Okay, let's assume that you're allowed to plug in any x value except 
2. So now you don't have to worry about getting a zero denominator, but that's a good point. So we're solving this just for values that are in the domain. So all x is not equal to 2. Any other thoughts about that? Think about when that fraction, how that fraction could be positive or how it could be negative. No, we're not going to need a reciprocal. In fact, the first step isn't even going to be algebraic. It's going to be basically using common sense. So you're looking at a fraction. Part of it has an absolute value in it. And we're trying to determine when something is going to be a positive number. So there's really only part of that fraction that's important here. Yeah? Um, only the top matters because as long as that's Right. Yeah, the bottom is always going to be positive. So you never have to worry about that being greater than zero. The only part that really matters here is the top. That's the part that might not be greater than zero. Okay. Any question why you don't have to worry about the bottom being greater than zero? It's all because of the absolute value. Okay. So all we really care about is when is the top greater than zero. So all you have to do is solve that problem. As long as you give me an x value greater than negative 3, that will always come out greater than 0. Always. Okay, so if you see a problem like that, try to, try to reason through a little bit if you can, and maybe get rid of parts of the problem that don't affect the answer, like the denominator in this case. All right, so that's, I think that's, that's good for today. Right, so the homework, um, tonight it's all on page uh, 108, and it's 5 through 7, 10, 11, 14 through 16, 19, 20, 22, 24 to 26, 29, on 34 to 38, just the evens, okay, just evens, then 42, 43, 49, and 60 to 62. Some of them are kind of tied together, like 60 to 62 might be a word problem and all three parts tie together. Okay, so try that for tonight and then uh, we'll go over that tomorrow.